quest for power is the driving force of history. Always has been, always will be. Those who fail to recognize this principle are not spared in the grand chess game, but rather are moved and manipulated by forces they do not understand. From the perspective of those who dominate the board, it is obviously preferable to have a population of ignorant pawns than it is to have an array of opponents which are capable of mounting an effective resistance. To that end, it has always been in the interest of the ruling class to cultivate illusions which obscure the true nature of the game. Manufacturing consent. What is that title meant to describe? Well, the title is actually borrowed from uh, a book by Walter Lippmann, written back uh, around 1921, in which he described what he called the manufacture of consent as a revolution in the practice of democracy. What it amounts to is a technique of control. Uh, and he said this was useful and necessary because uh, the common interests, the general concerns of all people, elude the public. Walter Lippmann wasn't speaking theoretically, nor was he commenting on a phenomenon that he had observed from a distance. He was part of that specialized class, and he personally influenced the development of this new technique, control. So what was this new technique that Lippmann was referring to? The answer to that question takes us back to the beginning of World War I. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson formed the Committee on Public Information, also known as the CPI. It was a propaganda agency, and its purpose was to build support for the war with the American people. The CPI, run by a man named George Creel, was known for its crude tactics, blatant exaggerations, and outright lies. However, one member of the CPI, Edward Bernays, had a much more subtle approach. Rather than resorting to lowbrow tactics, Bernays studied the mindset of the American people, and then based on his observations, he created a campaign to promote the idea that America's purpose in the war was to, quote, make the world safe for democracy. This meme was wildly successful, so much so that it continues to be used even to this day. Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew, and like his uncle, he was an avid student of human psychology. Some documentarians, such as Adam Curtis and his film The Century of the Self, have mistakenly assumed that the psychological techniques that Bernays went on to develop were merely the practical application of Freud's theories. However, though Freud had a significant influence on his nephew, the reality of the matter is that he was not the source of these ideas. Sigmund Freud, Edward Bernays, and Walter Lippmann all subscribed to a school of thought that was first put forth in 1895 by a French social psychologist named Gustave Le Bon. Le Bon wrote several books, the most famous of which was entitled Psychologie des Foules. It was translated into English as The Crowd, a study of the popular mind. The Crowd was a revolutionary piece of work. In it, Le Bon not only presented an in-depth description of group psychology and how it differed from individual psychology, but he also outlined a very simple set of principles that enable leaders to spark ideological contagion and thereby rise to power. Hitler, Goebbels, and Mussolini all studied Le Bon's writings, and they applied his techniques to the letter. The results that they attained were precisely those that Le Bon claimed that they would have. Funny how they leave that little detail out of most history books, don't you think? Sigmund Freud's book, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, was in fact a direct critique of the writings of Gustave Le Bon and William McDougall, which focused on the relationship between individual psychology and group psychology, and explained how human groups can be controlled for long periods of time through the manipulation of group identity, belief systems, and social structures. Edward Bernays studied the writings of Freud, Le Bon, Wilfred Trutter, Walter Lippmann, and many others. He then combined their perspectives and synthesized them into an applied science. The success of his Make the World Safe for Democracy meme during the war, both at home and abroad, planted the seed of an idea in Bernays' mind. Could group psychology tactics be applied during peacetime? When I came back to the United States, I decided that if you could use propaganda for war, you could certainly use it for peace. And propaganda got to be a bad word because of the Germans using it. So what I did was to try to find some other words. So we found the word Council on Public Relations. In 1919, Bernays opened the world's first public relations office. He named his agency the Council on Public Relations. It occurred to me that any young debutante who was aware of the times and of herself 
as a woman being discriminated against would be delighted to walk in the Easter parade with her bow uh, to dramatize the idea that cigarettes were indeed torches of freedom to and to validate uh, and to invalidate the taboo against women smoking. So I called up a debutant friend of mine, asked her to get another friend and two young men whom they liked. And they, I also instructed them on how to give information about what they did to the newsreels, weekly newsreels, to the newspapers, to the three important press associations, the AP, the United Press and International News Service, and to walk from 34th Street to 57th and back, it, and, back and forth lighting torches of freedom to protest man's inhumanity to women by a taboo against smoking. Next morning, there wasn't a newspaper in the United States. Even the New York Times had a front page story, debutantes light torches of freedom to protest man's inhumanity uh, to women by a taboo against smoking lighting cigarettes in their walk. The interesting thing to me was that within three days, the newspapers without any intercession on my part published accounts that women were smoking in Union Square in San Francisco, in Union Square in Denver, and on the Boston Commons. This was Bernays' specialty, engineering social trends for clients, and he was very, very good at it. Perception was now a commodity for sale of the highest bidder. Bernays aided the CIA and United Fruit Company, known today as Chiquita Brands International, in a successful campaign to topple the democratically elected Guatemalan government in 1954. He headed up the public relations campaign to garner support for the fluoridation of municipal water supplies on behalf of the aluminum mining company, Alcoa Incorporated, who was looking for a cheap way to dispose of their industrial waste. And he even helped the company convince the American public to eat heavier breakfast so that they would buy more bacon. What made Bernays so successful was his skill in applying three psychological tactics. One, creating carefully calculated associations with the subconscious fears and desires of individuals. Two, influencing opinion leaders and perceived authority figures in order to reach those who follow them. Three, initiating the contagion of behaviors and ideas through social conformity. Bernays wrote several books promoting these psychological tactics, including propaganda and crystallizing public opinion. In these books, he specifically encouraged governments and corporations to use his methodology to manipulate public perception. This suggestion did not fall on deaf ears. His techniques worked so well that they were adopted by virtually every sector that sought to influence the public media, politics, advertising, even the military. As Walter Lippmann had indicated, it was a revolution. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, found Bernays' approach very useful. Bernays acknowledged this fact in his 1965 autobiography entitled Biography of an Idea, where he wrote, Carl von Wiegand, foreign correspondent of the Hearst newspapers, an old hand at interpreting Europe and just returned from Germany, was telling us about Goebbels and his propaganda plans to consolidate Nazi power. Goebbels had shown Wiegand his propaganda library, the best vegan had ever seen. Goebbels, said vegan, was using my book Crystallizing Public Opinion as a basis for his destructive campaign against the Jews of Germany. Obviously, the attack on the Jews of Germany was no emotional outburst of the Nazis, but a deliberate, planned campaign. The events that transpired in Nazi Germany stunned the world, and they inspired several prominent psychologists to investigate how populations are convinced to commit atrocities. In the process, they inadvertently established the science behind Le Bon's and Bernays' methods. In 1951, psychologist Solomon Ash set out to study and measure the effects and causes of social conformity and its ability to alter perception. To do so, he ran a series of experiments in which he asked groups of students to participate in what he told them was a vision test. In reality, all but one of the participants in each test were actually actors, each of whom had been prepped to give specific answers at specific times. The subjects were shown a card with a line on it, followed by another card with three lines on it, labeled 1, 2, and 3. They were then asked which line in the second card matched the line on the first card in length. The lines were made in such a way that the correct answer was obvious. 
Each member of the group was asked to give their response one at a time, and the real participant always answered last or next to last. For the first two trials, the actors gave the obvious correct answer. However, beginning on the third trial, they would all give the same wrong answer. The goal was to ascertain how many people would conform to the perception of those around them when the group's position contradicted their own senses. The results surprised Ash. He had believed that the majority of participants would not conform and give an answer that was obviously wrong. However, results showed that 37% of people would conform to the crowd consistently, and 75% conformed at least some of the time. Ash was uncertain as to whether this conformity was limited to social compliance, or whether it was actually influencing perception on a neurological level. In 2005, neuroscientist Gregory Burns sought to answer this question. Burns created a variation of Ash's experiment, this time measuring brainwave activity during the test to determine at what level of the brain this conformity was taking place. The results showed very clearly that the occipital and parietal lobes were the most active when the participants were answering incorrectly. This meant that conformity was actually altering the perception of the test subjects at the neurological level. Take a moment and register what that means. Social conformity literally causes the brain to rewrite our reality. In 1961, Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted a series of experiments which measured the willingness of individuals to obey authority figures. In the experiment, test subjects were placed in a scenario where they were led to believe that when they flipped a switch, an electrical shock was being delivered to a person in the adjacent room. They were then ordered by a man in a white jacket claiming to be the official scientist in charge to ask the person in the next room a series of questions. If they received an incorrect response, they were to punish them by flipping the switch, thereby administering a shock. For example, the first line it reads, blue boy, girl, grass, hat. Now after you've read the four choices, the learner pushes one of the switches on the board in front of him, and the number he has selected will light up in this box, one, two, three, or four. Now if he gives the correct answer, you say correct and go on to the next line. The correct answer is underlined and is also indicated in the right margin. Yeah. If he were to indicate the wrong answer, you would say wrong. Then tell him the number of volts you're going to give him. Then give him the punishment then read the correct word pair once, and then go on to the next line. As the test progressed, the voltage level was steadily increased, and the screams from the next room became more and more desperate, begging to stop the test and stating multiple times that they had a heart condition. 330 volts. Many of the subjects expressed hesitation about continuing with the experiment on hearing the person in the other room scream and beg for help. Those that did were informed by the scientists that they had no choice but to continue. No consequences were threatened. Yet just this assertion was usually enough to achieve compliance. Under the influence of an apparent authority figure, 50 to 65 percent of subjects continued administering the shocks even up to the maximum 450 volt shock. They even continued after the person in the other room had stopped screaming, which indicated that they were unconscious or dead. Bird, car, train, plane. Go on, please. Please answer. The answer is bird, 345 volts. Blunt, knife, stick, word, arrow. Answer, please. Continue, please. The answer is arrow, 360 volts. Go on, please, with the experiment. Please continue. The Milgram Authority experiment has been repeated numerous times over the years, using individuals from a wide range of economic and social backgrounds. And the conclusions are always consistent. The aura of authority exercises an almost irresistible force over the human mind, easily overriding core morals and ethics. Even more shocking is the fact that no legitimate authority is necessary. Appearances suffice. The invisible government that Walter Lippmann, Edward Bernays, and Woodrow Wilson had referred to was not just an abstract concept. 
It was a very real and concrete reality, and they were well positioned to comment on it because they directly participated in its creation. It all started as an inquiry. The inquiry to the select few who knew was a group of 150 men assembled by Woodrow Wilson to gather the data that they thought necessary to quote, make the world safe for democracy after World War I was over. Among the known members of the inquiry were Walter Lippmann, Paul Warburg, better known as the father of the Federal Reserve, and Edward House, Wilson's closest advisor, the man responsible for convincing Wilson to sign the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. From 1917 to 1918, the group compiled over 2,000 documents to be used during post-war negotiations. The most famous of these was the 14 Points document, authored by Walter Lippmann, which proposed the creation of the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations. Then, to my surprise, they asked me to go over with, with Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference. And at the age of 1926, I was in Paris for the entire time of the peace conference that was held in the suburb of Paris. And we worked to make the world safe for democracy. That was a big slogan. After the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, a portion of the inquiry met at the Hotel Majestique with a number of British diplomats to discuss the forming of a permanent institution. This meeting eventually led to the decision to join forces with a group of high-ranking officers of banking, manufacturing, trading, and finance companies led by Elihu Root, a powerful corporate lawyer who was also a former United States Secretary of War and leading advocate of America's entry into World War I. On July 29, 1921, the merged group filed a certification of incorporation, officially forming the Council on Foreign Relations, also known as a CFR. The CFR went on to build a membership comprised of the world's most powerful business leaders, politicians, and corporations. Among the corporate members are Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Chevron, Exxon, Shell, BP Oil, General Electric, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Bloomberg, Rothschilds North America, and DynCorp International. You can find a complete list on the CFR website. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under President Eisenhower, is listed as one of the founding members of the CFR on their own website. It was Dulles that convinced Eisenhower to use the CIA to topple the democratically elected Prime Minister of Iran, Mohammad Mosaddegh, in 1953. The Shah, the puppet who was installed in his place, was a brutal dictator. He enjoyed full support from the U.S. government until he was overthrown in the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Dulles was also the man behind the 1954 CIA coup in Guatemala, and remember Bernays ran the propaganda for that operation. The tactic that Bernays chose was to convince the public that the Guatemalan government was backed by the Soviets. No less a figure than John Foster Dulles, head of the State Department, was part of the firm of lawyers acting for the United Fruit Company. His brother Alan was the head of the CIA. So it didn't take much of an effort on their part to persuade their president, a military man, Mr. Eisenhower, to give them the green light to overthrow Arbenz's government. U.S. Secretary of State Dulles takes the rostrum to urge united action by the Americas to outlaw international communist intervention in the Western Hemisphere. Bernays' tactic worked, even though the Soviet Union didn't even have diplomatic relations with Guatemala at the time. The Arbenz government, which had been in power from 1950, didn't enjoy any logistical support from the Soviet Union. We didn't even have diplomatic relations. There was no Soviet mission in Guatemala. Once again, Bernays set a trend. And for the next 40 years, the U.S. government would use the specter of communism to justify invasions and covert operations around the globe. 
Another member of the CFR, McGeorge Bundy, was National Security Advisor under Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. He was also the man responsible for encouraging the escalation of the Vietnam War, a prospect that Kennedy opposed and would not have allowed had he lived. This according to documents written by Bundy himself. President Nixon's National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, is also a member of the Council. Kissinger was the man behind the CIA coup which overthrew the democratically elected president of Chile, Salvador Allende. The puppet they installed in Allende's place, Augusto Pinochet, was another brutal dictator who tortured and killed thousands of his own citizens. The U.S. government politely looked the other way. Carter's national security advisor, Zygmunt Brzezinski, is also a member of the council. In 1972, I became director of the Trilateral Commission, an American, Japanese, West European public organization. In 1976, I directed the Foreign Policy Task Forces for Jimmy Carter. Then I became the National Security Advisor for four years. Then I went back to private life, although in 1988 I was co-chairman you know, with Brent Scowcroft and Henry Kissinger of the Foreign Policy Task Force for, for Vice President Bush. You mentioned something earlier that you've done that comes up right in the spot that you're sitting <clears throat> many times by our callers across the country, and that is a suspicion that there is a conspiracy for through the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. You ran the Trilateral Commission for how long? About three years, I think. Something like that, three years. Not only did I run it, I helped to found it and organize it with David Rockefeller. It was Ingrid Brzezinski who was behind the funding and arming of the Mujahideen in Pakistan and Afghanistan, a tactic designed to incite the Soviets to invade. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. Ronald Reagan's National Security Advisors Richard B. Allen and Robert C. McFarlane are also members of the council, as was his Secretary of State, George Shultz. George Shultz was behind the attempted overthrow of the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. This was part of the Iran-Contra scandal. The Contras, which Reagan and Shultz were arming and training through the CIA, killed, tortured, raped, mutilated, and abducted hundreds of civilians that they suspected of sympathizing with the Sandinistas. George H.W. Bush was a director of the CFR from 1977 to 1979, and his Secretary of State, James Baker, is a current member. You might remember this clip from 2012 where Baker and Clinton joked about the plan to take out Iran. There will also be many, many side effects, all of them adverse, from an Israeli strike. But at the end of the day, if we don't get it done the way the administration's working on it now, which I totally agree with, then we ought to take them out. Secretary Clinton. <laughs> Well, we're, hey, work that's a we're that's working a hard, we're working hard. I said at the end of the day, at the end of the day may be next year. It will be, it will be next year. Kind of sounds like an inside joke, doesn't it? One year after this interview, the Obama administration attempted to initiate an attack on the Syrian government. This was designed to draw in Iran, which has a mutual defense agreement with Syria. Obama took an indirect route by funding and arming militants who then committed atrocities and blamed them on government forces. Sound familiar? Well, perhaps that's because Zygmunt Brzezinski was Obama's personal mentor. Uh, somebody who uh, has over decades trained uh, some of the most prominent foreign policy specialists, uh, not just in the Democratic Party, but uh, has trained a number uh, who ended up in the Republican Party as well. Uh, he is one of our most outstanding scholars, uh, one of our most outstanding thinkers. Uh, he has proven to be an outstanding friend uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from. Uh, and for him to support me in this campaign and then uh, be willing to come out uh, here to Iowa is a testimony to his generosity. So if everybody could please give Dr. Brzezinski another round of applause. 
Bill Clinton is also a member of the council, and his Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, is currently serving on the board of directors. Madeleine Albright was in charge of the sanctions on Iraq that were in place during the entire Clinton administration. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Colin Powell, who led the charge to war with Iraq by presenting false evidence to the UN in 2003, is also currently on the CFR Board of Directors. Indeed, the facts and Iraq's behavior show that Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> George W. Bush's National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, his Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and his Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson are all current members of the CFR. Henry Paulson, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, was the man behind the banker bailouts in 2008. Goldman Sachs, which just happens to be a corporate member of the CFR, was one of the primary beneficiaries of that bailout. Another CFR member, Robert Gates, was Secretary of Defense under both Bush and Obama. Obama's first National Security Advisor, James L. Jones, is a CFR member, as is Obama's second National Security Advisor, Tom Vanillen, his third National Security Advisor, Susan Rice, his second Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, his first Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, as was his first Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. John Kerry, Obama's second Secretary of State, acknowledged that he was a member of the CFR in a speech given at the Council in 2003, but he's no longer listed on the official roster. In the Senate, Dianne Feinstein is listed as a member, as is John McCain, Joe Lieberman, and former Senator Christopher Dodd. Christopher Dodd is currently the president of the Motion Picture Association of America. In that role, he was the driving force behind the SOPA and PIPA internet bills. Three out of six of the current board members of the Federal Reserve, Daniel Tarullo, Jerome Powell, and Janet Yellen, are all publicly listed as members of the council. This cozy relationship between the Federal Reserve and the CFR goes back to the very beginning. Paul Warburg was a founder of both organizations and he held positions in both of them concurrently. He was a director of the council from its creation in 1921 until his death in 1932, and he served on the Federal Reserve Board from 1921 to 1926. His son, James Warburg, who is also a CFR member, is most famous for the statement he made before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations on February 17, 1950, in which he said, We shall have world government whether we like it or not. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. Carol Quigley was an author and professor of history at Georgetown University. He was also a personal mentor to President Bill Clinton. And then, as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Quigley served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, and the House Select Committee on Astronomics and Space Exploration. He was not a fringe lunatic by any stretch of the imagination, but was in fact a respected member of the establishment. That's what makes the statements he made in his book, Tragedy and Hope, so significant. Tragedy and Hope was a dense and highly detailed historical volume which covered world history from 1914, with an emphasis on analyzing the driving forces of civilization. The book was completely uncontroversial, that is, until you get to the middle, where he makes the following statement. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way that the radical right believes that the Communist Act. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups, and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network because I have studied it for 20 years, and I was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims, and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its instruments. I have objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. Quigley specifically identified the CFR and the Institute of International Affairs as key hubs in this roundtable network, and he confirmed its close relationship to banking and finance. The Institute of International Affairs, also known as the Chatham House, is a sister organization of the CFR. It was created in 1920 by the British diplomats who attended the meeting at the Hotel Majestique in Paris in 1919. 
There are chapters of the Institute of International Affairs in Australia, Belgium, France, Italy, Portugal, Norway, Poland, Finland, Hungary, Sweden, New Zealand, South Africa, Nigeria, Pakistan, Singapore, Japan, and in other countries as well. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. The secret to the power that the Council on Foreign Relations and the other roundtable groups wield lies in a clever application of the techniques that Bernays developed. They target individual psychology by cultivating a sense of exclusivity and prestige, which plays upon people's desire to feel important and powerful. Like Bernays, they manipulate the public indirectly by targeting opinion leaders and authority figures, by influencing their membership, which is comprised of men and women in the highest levels of government, business, and finance. They hijack the phenomenon observed in the Milgram Authority experiments while bypassing the electoral process. Most of the meetings held at the CFR are run under Chatham House rules, meaning that the ideas discussed there may be used and spread by those present, but no one is allowed to mention where those ideas came from. Uh, I would like to remind the audience it says here that this meeting is not for attribution. This means that participants are welcome to make use of the information received at the meeting, but neither the identity of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed, nor may one cite a council meeting as the source of the information. These closed-door discussions and their exclusive membership process work together to engineer the phenomenon demonstrated in the Ashton Formid experiments. New members must be nominated by an existing member, seconded by three members, and approved by the board of directors. This process ensures that ideological continuity is maintained as social conformity brings new members into line with the group. It's important to remember that wealth, social status, and official positions of power do not reduce the effects of group psychology. We get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. To put it in simple terms, the politicians aren't the ones calling the shots. They're just puppets. Voting the bums out doesn't work, and it hasn't for a long, long time. Now you know why. Even if we remove every single corrupt oligarch from the councils of government, we will end up right back in the same situation unless we deal with the psychological underpinnings of our enslavement. But how do we do that? How do we reach the group mind and shake the crowd from its slumber? Group psychology is a weapon. And like all weapons, it is capable of being used for good or for evil. For many years, it has been in the wrong hands. It has been hidden from the public and used against them. It's time for the people to pick up that weapon and use it to free themselves. It's time to start studying. Read Gustave Le Bon's books, The Crowd and Psychology of Revolution. Read Edward Bernays' books, Propaganda and Crystallizing Public Opinion. And read Gene Sharp's books, From Dictatorship to Democracy and National Security Through Civilian-Based Defense. Learn the theory, learn the techniques, and start using them to spread the truth rather than hiding it. Start using them to prevent wars rather than start them. Start using them to stop the militarization of the police and to end the surveillance state. Use them to bring this corporate mafia to its knees. Some of you may find this proposition frightening. This is dangerous stuff. These are ideological M16s with boxes of ammunition. If even a few motivated individuals started using these techniques effectively, it could seriously disrupt the balance of power. But that is exactly what's needed. I challenge you to look around. Look at the state of the world. Look at where these psychopaths are taking us. If you do not feel the imperative to change the course that we are on, then you're not paying attention. And so just as I say we aren't gonna let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't gonna let any injunction turn us around.
feel as strongly as we do that the public needs to see this information, then make a commitment to get this film into the hands of as many people as possible. Share it through social media, post it on your website, send it to your friends via email, or pass it out on the street. You have permission to download this video and distribute it and display it in any non-commercial way. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, be sure to subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. And click the little gear on the subscribe button to have YouTube send you an email notification of new uploads. Also sign up for email updates on our website, stormcloudsgathering.com, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Special thanks to everyone who donated on our website over the past year to make this film possible. We really sincerely appreciate your support.